Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns. Those Anti-Federalists, they absolutely got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty does work for you. And hey, you know, this is already February. Wow. You know, here we are, moving into the second month of the year. So many things have happened this week. We had the State of the Union Address. We've had uh, the, oh gosh, uh, so much going on that uh, I almost forgot to introduce myself. Yes, this is. This is Tom Novolis, your host. And man, I, I'll tell you, every day that I keep studying where we are, I <coughs> absolutely am so delighted that Sam Adams is my alter ego. He just was, the, yes, that firebrand, but also he was that great intellectual that knew how to stimulate our minds so that we would look at what did it mean to uh, go after liberty, to love liberty, to try and figure out how to preserve what is liberty. And we're going to jump back into the Federalist again today, and I'm not leaving Federalist 39 in particular uh, because I didn't cover it sufficiently last week, and uh, I think we need to because it is absolutely critical in regards to what we observed, especially this last week, in in, in respect to, more than anything else, in respect to what happened at the State of the Union. Now, true to myself, okay, I did not watch the State of the Union. I have not watched a State of the Union since probably Reagan's first State of the Union. That's the the last one that I watched on TV. Haven't listened to them. I always look at them later, read them later, or now with the YouTube technology, one can watch it. I haven't even watched it yet. The point of all of that is to look at all of the reporting, that is, how it's manipulated and maneuvered by all sides, all sides in respect to what was actually said. So I can't comment on what was actually said, but I can comment on the reactions because I'm going to work assumptively, and that's going to tie back into what we're looking at in Federalist number 39 in particular, and it's going to kind of drive on some of the key points of what does it mean to find and preserve liberty. What is that? Uh, What is the source of it? And not only that, how does that come together in our form of a uh, republic? That, that's what 39 talks about, is our republic. And then what I'm going to do is kind of wrap it up. I don't know where I'll jump in here with it, but I am going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, Delphi technique uh, process. Best example of that that I have ever seen was after Obama uh, came into office. <clears throat> well, it's not the best, but let's say the largest, largest implementation of it was when Obama came into office and they wanted to do this budget thing. Do any of you remember that? Did anybody b- besides myself and a group of patriots that uh, I knew from our local uh, citizens group participate in that budget process? Yes, it was the Delphi technique put on steroids across the nation with big TV screens and all this other stuff. So, you know what, if we don't get to it, uh, I'll put a couple references and links uh, of information on that Delphi technique because, ladies and gentlemen, what has happened is that the media... The mass media, the generalized media, MSNBC, CNN, all of them, as well as the Democrats, are very well practiced. Now, we saw that the gentleman, the senator from West Virginia, actually, he stepped away from his Democratic fold uh, because, as he said afterwards, is that 
you know, Trump's doing the right things. He's doing those things that are meaningful for the people of West Virginia. And so it's not about party. And that's even true with the Republicans, is that it is not about party. It is about principle, to which, guess what, Sam Adams warned about, uh, Madison even warned about, uh, Jay warned about, Hamilton I'm not so sure about, but uh, with... Uh, you know, Washington, in his farewell address, was emphatic, emphatic that we should do what? We should stay away from that party spirit and stay on principles. So I think that's what Federalist 39 really drives on, is what are those principles and what does that mean? And yes, you can see behind me that the yeah, the, the Founders' Constitution volumes are kind of leaning because, yeah, we're going to pull out Volume 1 again, and uh, we're going to utilize that as part of our resource uh, as we talk about uh, Federalist 39 and uh, all the resources in, in context to it. So <clears throat> where does it start? It, it starts now with um, the the person that is now the president and chairperson of uh, Planned Parenthood presently. Uh, I guess that person's getting ready to retard, or she is retarded, retire, that's what it is. And uh, in that, she was part of the contrarian State of the Union uh, uh, process and address that the enemy was holding. So in fact... What they were doing was proving that they are contrarians of our system, of our political design, of that which our framers gave us, and that they are true to form, absolutely desirous as globalist, socialist, and communist neo-Marxists all together wanting to change who and what we are in America. So in that other process that they were doing during the time of the State of the Union, she had the remarks in her talk and her component of this thing that they did is that she is calling for what? She is calling for some of the things that I talk about in my book. Oh, yeah, we're going to plug the book several times today because it's going to be out in March and so, yeah, and we even changed the title, kind of shortened it up, and we're going to call it that workbook for two constitutions that goes hand-in-hand hand with the seminar that I do on the tale of two constitutions. But that's it right there. That's it. You see, they, they don't even want the uh, what's going on with our messed-up constitutional republic at the moment. You know, what's changed with it? That they want to, and as she is saying, they want to get rid of it. And what needs to be implemented is what? A representative democracy. Quote, end quote. Representative democracy. You know, hey, Madison and all of those that went to convention in 1787, looked at all of those forms of governance. And quite frankly, a democracy they knew absolutely led to despotism and tyranny. A representative democracy they looked at and said, well, you know, that's almost no different than what they have in England, what they had in Poland, what they had in uh, the Netherlands and you know several other places, and they don't work. They don't secure your liberty as we the people understand that idea of liberty. So we have a lot of work cut out for us. Uh, some of the things that I was meeting with on Tuesday were some other uh, patriot leaders, if you will, or or uh, leaders of uh, other citizens groups and organizations to talk about what are some of the things that we can commonly observe to ensure that our republic and republican form of government guaranteed in the constitution is maintained what are those items that many groups can coalesce around well <laughs> we we came up with a simple answer quite frankly is that what we can coalesce around 
is no different than what everybody coalesced around during the American Revolution, taxation. Yes, at the national level, we've had some really major things that have happened that are giving us some tax relief. Obviously, it's not to the extent that we probably really need to get to, but it's very, very significant. And I think that it is definitely moving in the right direction. So with that, I applaud what the the president and then with the <coughs> Republican House and Senate were able to pull off and uh, definitely get through on giving us tax relief. Very, very important. And that goes in with trade. How does that work at the local level? Because really that's what we're talking about when you look at the patriot groups. And, and that's what Madison talks about also when we look at federalism in the context of Federalist 39 kind of rolls through 38 and rolls into 39 and, and we'll get into some of those specific definitions at the beginning of this segment but or the end of this segment and into the beginning and the the next two segments but the the whole point is is that when you look at what's happening locally national taxation national issues boy those are the ones that everybody gets all emotionally tweaked on and we forget that oh well, we don't live in Washington, D.C., folks. You know, We don't live uh, in that Potomac region. We don't even live in the swamp. Well, i got a swamp in my backyard when everything thaws out and it rains. But, you know, we don't live in <coughs> the place of the national hydra. We have hydras in our townships. We have hydras in our counties. And we have hydras in our states. So as we look at what does that mean for us, it means that we have to look at that taxation, not just at that national level. We have to look at all that's happening at those bureaucratic agencies that then reach down into the local levels, into the county level, not just the state level, but down into the county level and then into the townships that affect what? Education, property rights, roads, taxation. You know, what we have going on in local taxation is very, very critical. And that's something that we were able to come to a clear mindset on Tuesday night while everyone else was enjoying the president's uh, speech we were working on what does it mean, what does it matter from that local perspective in what we need to do to be able to, what, get tax relief here. Did you know that in Ohio in general, and I'll talk Ohio because that's where I live, and in my county and the county just north of me, that 67% of our tax dollars go to education. I'd sure like to know what the ROI is for that and why do they keep screaming for more when I don't think we're getting our money's worth out of the educational system, especially, as we'll talk in 39, as we talk about what education is supposed to do, develop American citizens. And we're not doing that. We saw that by the lawlessness of the Democrats here the other day at the at at the, uh, the State of the Union when they brought illegals into the people's house. I'm offended by that. I'm grossly offended that illegal people were allowed into the people's house. So you know what? I think Donald Trump had it right. We the people, the real citizens in America are dreamers. My kids are dreamers. My grandkids are definitely dreamers. You know what? We need to take care of our dreamers here. And that's what Samuel Adams was talking about in Liberty. That's what Madison is talking about as we look at what form of government will best fit. And man, I'm, I'm going to take you through some of the things here in the Founders Constitution as it was brought together that you may not know, but as we look at what is important for the future of America, 
It's that we all should be dreaming and not allowing lawlessness and illegal activity to prevail. Come on back in the next segment when Samuel Adams returns here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to this second segment of Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist. Got it right here on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty does work for you. And this is Tom Novolis, your host. And wow, I'm delighted you're back with me again. And yes, I did. I know I pushed your button a little bit there in this last segment on emotionalism, which I really don't like to do because I think we need to be uh, people of uh, some sensibility, common sense, factual information. But you know something? We are emotional beings as well. And that's how God designed us. And to the extent that the, uh, I just call them what they are, the enemy, and that goes all the way back to Satan, the great enemy, uh, will always play on our emotions. We'll always play on that which uh, causes us to react instead of act on principle, truth, and uh, just basic reality of what God's doing in the world as well. So, you know, that that's part and parcel to the whole thing. But in what the framers did with the Constitution, and as Madison talks about very clearly in the Federalist Papers, one of the reasons for good government is because you and I aren't angels. So not being angels, we don't maintain uh, that moral capacity. Even, you know, I got to tell you, I, I, I talk to a lot of people who call themselves Christians and even a lot of people who call themselves in the Reformed or Orthodox aspect of that. And you know what? We're all sinful. So the, the thing is, is that we're moving through this process of life you know, in the hope of what our salvation has given us so that we would do right, that we would do those types of things that would be just and true. But not everybody's going to do that, okay? Not everybody is going to be consistent in that. I always tell the, I told this one pastor one time, just as a point of it, is that, you know, Hey, that might have been a great sermon that was preached, but did you go out to the parking lot and watch everybody trying to leave? He gave me this really dumbfounded look. Huh? What do you mean? I said, obviously you've never been out in a parking lot. And it was really a great sermon on, you know, how to love one another. Uh, let's see, I was cut off three times uh, the last Sunday. The light came on. So the point being is it's not about being a hypocrite or anything, but it is that we need to have a system that is established in such a manner that it maintains liberty because we're not angels and angels don't rule. So when man rules over man, the, the possibilities of being tyrannical and despotic are, are, are there. So we have to have some kind of a balanced system that allows that to work for us and to be established on a nation a rule of law. That's exactly what we ended up with, and not everybody agreed with it, because I, I'm going to read something to you here out of the Founders' Constitution, which is, to me, very, very exciting, you know, in the fact that I wrote the book up here, Not All Conservatives Are Constitutionalist, and in that, you know, there's this whole plethora concept of what in the world is a conservative. Wow. Well, when it comes to what we're talking about now, in 39, it, what is a Republican? And the ideas and the philosophies around that, we'll touch here in a little bit, is extremely interesting. But Madison got to the point of trying to define uh, what a, a republic was. He goes through this whole, and, and continues in there, going through the whole process of talking about all of these other nations and historical uh, nations that were supposed to be a republic. And going through that whole thing of, you know what, democracy just does not work. It becomes tyrannical. And, oh, yeah, that gal... 
that uh, from Planned Parenthood that wants us to have a representative democracy. It, it, her rationale for it was so that people could freely have abortions and that women can have, <coughs> let's see, women's health. No, I'm sorry. That, that's not an issue. So, you know, anyway, you go, go search it out there on Google and, or whatever. I hope you use DuckDuckGo instead of Google. But DuckDuckGo is a, a much better search engine, a little more secure, if you will. But uh, anyway, the, Madison goes on here, and he's talking about all of the different, uh, what is a genuine republic, show the extreme inaccuracies with which the term has been used in political disquisitions. So he goes on, if we resort for a criterion to the different principles on which different forms of government are established, we may define a republic to be, or at least may bestow that name on, a government which derives all of its power directly or indirectly from the great body of the people, and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure for a limited period period, limited period, <clears throat> or during good behavior. So he kind of leaves open that whole thing on term limits, if you will, uh, limited behavior, which he defined for two years for, you know, the direct elected uh, representatives of the people, six years for those representatives or senators that should be uh, appointed by state legislators and not elected by the general population. But I, I won't get on my 17th Amendment kick here because we're talking about what is a republic. All right. So, which that's important to understand that. So he goes on to say, it is essential to such a government that it be derived from the great body of the society, not from an inconsiderable proportion or a flavored class of it. Otherwise, a handful of tyrannical nobles exercising their oppression by a delegation of their powers might aspire to the rank of Republicans and claim for uh, their government the honorable title of Republic. I have to stop there a little bit because you know, we're seeing some changes in the Republican Party in that, and that is the Republican Party. I call it the Republican Party because, as you know, that definition, they repudiate a lot of things, or are, anyway. The, the point is, is that you can get, and what we see is the donor class, we see those special classes of elitist, uh, those of rank, uh, those of power, those of moneyed interests, for the most part, <coughs> we're doing what? How much money does it take to run for U.S. Senate? Oh, quite a few million dollars. What is it averaging now? Well, let's see, for a congressman, it averages probably four to eight million, ten million in some tough locations. Uh, Senate, you know, you can run up a bill of ten, twenty, fifty maybe 60, 70 million bucks. You know, what was it down in uh, <coughs> Alabama there? You know, you saw the, 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 what, NRC and a few of the others dump in 40 million. 40 million. So f to buy a U.S. senator, I'm sorry, to get a U.S. senator elected, you know, it costs you about $40 million. Yeah, I got Kath over here laughing on that one, so I hope you got a good chuckle as well. But, uh, you know, when you get to it, it's like exactly what he was talking about here. This was the purpose of defining a constitutional republic is because you get this favored class, and next thing you know, they're taken in, they, they bring in their tyrannical nobles. So you had this uh, special political class of the Democrats whose ideology is absolutely, absolutely, did you get it? Absolutely contrary to constitutionalism in our republic okay that's the democrats and they keep proving it over and over so let's go on here 
And what Madison is saying, it is sufficient for such a government that the persons administering it be appointed either directly or indirectly by the people and that they hold their appointments by either of the tenures just specified. Otherwise, every government in the United States as well as every other popular government, get it, popular government, populist government, okay, uh, that has been or can be well organized or well executed would be degraded from the Republican character. Wow. You know, so when you start looking at that, and then he goes into a whole discourse here <clears throat> on uh, the constitutions of every state in the union, uh, how they're elected, how the people are either elected or appointed, uh, looking at the all of the components of that uh, and discussing you know some of the issues around tenure of the offices then he goes into could any further proof be required of the Republican uh, complexion of the system the most decisive one might be found in its absolute prohibition of titles of nobility both under the federal and state governments and in its express guarantee of the Republican form to each of the latter. So one of the key elements that we look at that's helping quantify and define what we are is that we have no titles of nobility. That's definitely in both state and national and the federal constitution. So how is it that you know John Kerry and Obama got some titles of nobility and accepted them and never got spanked for that. Wow. Very, very interesting. They accepted them. All right, but anyway, I'll let you go check that out, figure it out. But it was not sufficient, says the adversaries of the proposed Constitution, those anti-federalists, if you will, for the convention to adhere to the Republican form. They ought, with equal care, to have preserved the federal form which regards the Union as a confederacy of sovereign states, instead of which they have framed a national government, which regards the Union as a consolidation of the states. And it is asked by what authority this bold and radical innovation was undertaken. The handle which had been made of this objection requires that it should be examined with some precision. Now, this is where I am going to once again and have given you the references to, uh, you know, Federalist Number 39, because I think it's important that you go back and you look at it and you read it. And uh, he goes on to, without inquiry into the accuracies of the distinction on which the objection is founded, it will be necessary just to estimate of its force, first, the assertion, the real character of the government in question. Secondly, to inquire how far the convention were authorized to propose such a government. And thirdly, how far the duty they owe to their country could supply any defect of regular authority. So he goes through talking about first is to ascertain the real character of the government. What does it look like? Where does its source come from? The powers of it. And on examining that, as I talked about last week, it appears on one hand that the Constitution is to be founded on the assent and ratification of the people of America given by deputizing elected for the special purposes, but on the other that it is assented and ratification is to be given by the people, not as individuals composing one entire nation, but as composing the district and independent states to which they respectively belong. It is to be the assent and ratification of the several states derived from the supreme authority in each state, the authority of the people themselves. The act, therefore, establishing the Constitution will not be a national, but a federal act. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what we're talking about, is that we have a federated republic, but we, the people, are the absolute authority. And there's no democracy in this except at the very, very, very local level. 
But when it comes to the national government, if you do anything with it different than what they're talking about here and what Madison is looking at, we're going to have everything messed up, and it's going to lead to what he talked about at the very beginning of this, to despotism and tyranny. So come on back in the next segment when Samuel Adams returns and those anti-federalists, they caused the question for the discussion so we would know what a constitutional republic looks like. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this third segment of Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they got it right. You know why? They forced the question. They forced the issues, and they were predictive. And once again, we're here on Liberty Works Radio Network, and this is Tom Navolis, your host, and I switched it up on you a little bit in this segment, is that, hey, take a look at some of those other hosts and hostesses, the weekly programming that's going on on Liberty Works Radio Network. Check it out. There's some good stuff there. You know, for that Maryland market, you guys got so much going on there. Maryland... You know, I feel bad because you have the swamp that takes, and all the swamp creatures that live in Maryland. I mean, my sister lives in Maryland, you know, so I know uh, about those swamp creatures there. And guess what? You guys, you know, you're 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 in a fight. Those that are the liberty-minded uh, citizens in Maryland, in particular, and in uh, those few that are in Northern Virginia. You know, you guys are right in the middle of the battle just trying to secure your local governments, let alone what's going on in your states. So I, I give you a lot of credit for what you're doing, and thank you very much uh, for all of that. And thanks for having me here on Liberty Works Radio Network because uh, I enjoy being here. And I hope that uh, we continue to increase our listenership. And with that, you know what? Go hit that Donate button. Uh, take the time to donate there. And while I'm in the plugging mood, or, you know, yeah, plugging mood, I guess that's what you call it. I'm getting a look from Kath over there. Is that uh, we should take and talk about <coughs> the book for just a minute. Because as we looked at, here we have that woman from Planned Parenthood wanting to change our whole national form of government. A lot of you uh, that in the western states in particular, and uh, once so far here in Ohio, have taken and been to my seminars on uh, the tale of two constitutions. And it, it's intriguing for you to understand because the point being, when and what you're seeing really uh, exemplified here, is that when you're asking your uh, Congress people, those in elected offices, to stand on the Constitution. They are. They're doing it. And I explain that in my book, the workbook for two constitutions, which goes from covenant to the present Constitution. And when I talk about the present Constitution, I talk about it in every aspect of what it is operationally right now. Have the words of the 87 Constitution that people carry around in their pockets, you know, one of these, or the Citizen's Handbook, have those words changed, including the amendments? No, nah, not really. But the implementation, the action, uh, all of the various laws, all of the treaties, all of those other activities, I go and I explain that, yeah, your, your elected officials, unless we hold them accountable, are definitely operating according to the Constitution as it is. So, you know what? Go on uh, the Samuel Adams Returns website and look at the books and videos there, and you'll see the uh, textbook and tyranny, the, uh, uh, the workbook for two constitutions. Click on that. You know, you'll even be able to uh, reserve a copy and uh, you can click on a link there that'll take you to the author's notes and uh, even the introduction. So you get a little bit of freebie uh, preview of uh, what's in the book. So I encourage you to do that. So with that, we're going to slide right along into this whole thing. And, and, and what's really interesting is that Chapter 4 within uh, the Founders Constitution from the University of Chicago deals with uh, Republican government. 
And there's a lot here. I mean, their references are, well, I use a lot of their references in my book, so I know how good their references are. But uh, one of the things that I like here is where he talks about, and I bring out because I've written other blog posts on that, on where economy starts to override liberty. And this is in that Republican format that becomes a fear concept. And he talks about this idea is that much more vexing uh, were the, pro- the probable effects of those developments upon the habits, taste, concerns of a self-governing people. Republicanism presupposes a people who care about the res publica, the public thing. Commerce changes the focus of individuals' vision. Manufacturing permits, while encouraging the indulgence of private gratifications and a life cut off from the soil is, to that extent, a life of increased dependency on the wills of other men, could one still speak of Republican citizens when contemplating merchants for which the mere spot they stand on does not constitute so strong an attachment as that from which they draw their grain. Interesting. Jefferson to Horatio Gates kind of wrote that and cites in uh, his papers uh, this whole idea. And then he goes on is that would the avarice that set men in modern in motion leave them the taste or energy for pursuing the public's concerns. Recognizing those problems was a first step toward trying to cope with them, and there were among the American founders of Republican government those who were intent on facing the challenge. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here on John Locke in his second uh, treatise, uh, Montesquieu's Spirit of the Law is a reference, uh, the Spirit of Commerce. The question that was being asked and the, and the point that was being driven here was that when you take and you start looking at a commercial environment, when you start looking at what did, does it mean to get your paycheck over an understanding of <coughs> your liberty, your property, the land that you farm, uh, It it changes the way that people think. We've seen that. So when we see the modern implementation of constitutionalism to a certain extent is that how does a republic function within that context? How is it then, as I even talk about in my book, when we look at what happened in the great industrialization of the 1800s, that next thing, instead of the farmer having and the, the, the other workers having the capacity to self-govern in so many ways, all of a sudden they thought the industrialists were smarter than them. And to the extent that we see today, especially in the Democrats, is that, you know what, the intelligentsia is smarter than everybody else. You know, I, I just, I really, really enjoy uh, Thomas Sowell's book on the intelligentsia and society. I think he just nails it across the board in that, and that's you know part of the conundrum that we have at the present. So that paragraph kind of links us to chapter 18, so I'm going to flip way over there. And in chapter 18, what this is talking about is an epilogue. And in the epilogue of <coughs> this whole first volume is actually talking about securing the republic. Ladies and gentlemen, he starts out just with that whole idea of what Dr. Franklin was asked, you know, by the lady at the end of the convention and just going, okay, Dr. Franklin, you know, what type of government did you give us, you know, what is this thing? And he says, you know, a republic, oh, she asks, you know, what what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. So the purposes of what I... Uh, press on here in these programs is to go more into the depth than just talking about the Constitution, but going into these principles. <clears throat> and what's it going to take to keep keep the Republic? Because we know that during the convention, 
that that's what the framers really saw what they really were able to drive home for us is that understanding so one of the things that we come through here as we look at <coughs> what, what the founders were putting together is a proper founding implied a proper regard for the principles of preservation so I guess when we look at and I talk about that in my book uh, not all conservatives are constitutionalists is that constitutionalism is derived and based on principles and what are those principles so we can say to conserve or preserve is a fundamental principle of a conservative but it has to be based on the principles of constitutionalism and so uh, also what we talk about here is that there could be a trifling in matters uh, of vast concerns uh, to uh, propose a form of government without giving heed to how it might be best preserved against the most likely sources of internal corruption and external danger. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have going on in the Republic right now is a lot of internal corruption. Hey, the memos released, you know what? Get it out there. We need to have that accountability. That's what we have to have. You know, so this whole thing that's been going on everywhere on release the memo, internal corruption. We have to get rid of it. So when we talk about that, it's not only the internal corruption, but what kind of people. But governmental institutions could go only so far. While a constitution and its institutions might elicit and shape certain kinds of conduct, it is also was true that a corrupt or slavish people could ruin even a very good constitution. What really mattered in the last analysis was the kind of people who would make up the American public, their strengths, their limits, were the outer boundaries of what was possible. The civic character of that public was neither a given, fixed beyond the power of statesmen to alter or direct, nor an infinitely malleable substance to be shaped by the institutions at will or whim. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I talk about this over and over again uh, as Samuel Adams in character, in the facts that and, you know, John Adams, Madison, and all of them talked about a moral and virtuous people. You know, we can get into that, but we're going to run out of time here very shortly on the whole aspect of what that morality and virtue is. Public virtue is that, and what they, the, the framers of the Constitution were looking at <coughs> is, once again, that it would be the rule of law. The rule of law. And, and it goes to that argument, and I will always substantiate the argument between the difference of the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist because it proves out when you look at morality and virtue coming from that common respect, that common idea and principles of people willing to obey the rule of law. Well, you know, it always comes down to the whole aspect. If you don't know what's right and wrong, if you can't identify that from the basics of the Ten Commandments... Where, where are you going to even get the concept of <clears throat> the principle of obedience to the rule of law? We saw the Democrats violate the rule of law at the State of the Union. They violated by bringing illegals. Oh, they made the excuse, oh, these were DACA people. You know, these were people that had, well, Obama's executive order for DACA was illegal and unconstitutional. So violation of the rule of law, internal enemies. Always comes back to this. Always comes back to, you know, the, the Federalist, Madison, all of these folks here that talk about the character of who the American people would be, Expected the pulpits to do their job, to be able to preach a gospel of liberty, truth, and morality by which we would self-govern. That's where it starts. Anti-Federalists got it right. They said, nope, man's sinful, and you can't always count on the pulpits to do the right thing 
for a lot of different reasons because they were seeing things coming apart or all the other battles that happened during the Reformation. It comes down to this. Who are you in your relationship with the living God so that you can self-govern yourself and participate in this great republic that divine providence gave us? And they talk about that, that divine providence gave us this republic. So it's up to you to take and read, yes, get in there and read Madison and what we have here because otherwise the predictive results that we're living from the anti-federalists are absolutely right here on Samuel Adams Returns because they did, those anti-federalists got it right.